Shalom and welcome to Temple Talk. This is Yitzhak Rubin speaking to you from just east of Jerusalem. Today is the 12th day of Adar Shein, second Adar 5782. It's March 15th, the Ides of March 2022. This coming Shabbat, we are reading Parshat Sav, which begins in the book of Leviticus, chapter 6, verse 1, concludes chapter 8, verse 36. And tomorrow evening is Purim the great festive festival of Purim uh, tomorrow morning, beginning with sunrise and concluding with sunset, is the fast of Esther, Ta'anit Esther, the fast that we observe just before Purim. We're going to be talking about that and other things, mainly focusing on Purim, this show with a little bit about Sav, uh, but I must uh, apologize because I'm not so prepared for this show, and the reason I'm not so prepared is that uh, my beloved mother-in-law passed away this past Sunday evening, and my wife is in Avelut, she's sitting Shiva, she's in mourning, sitting Shiva, the seven-day initial mourning period that we observe. So I've been very, very preoccupied uh, with all that, and I really haven't had much time to sit and prepare so a lot of what I'm going to say is going to be off the top of my head, and uh, hopefully I will uh, have what to say and won't be wasting any of your time. Uh, I just would like to um, begin, however, uh, mention again my uh, wonderful mother-in-law. She really was a wonderful woman, a wonderful mother-in-law. I loved her very much, and there's a custom that we Jews have. It's actually a Sephardi custom. Uh, and as far as the Jews, where we say far as far the Jews, we are referring to Jews um, from North Africa, from uh, the Middle East, um, uh, from Spain. Uh, basically, I'm going to go into a little lesson here. Uh, Sfardi really technically means Sfarad is the Hebrew word for Sp Spain, and so the Jews who were uh, exiled from Spain in 1492. Um, and then moved out of Spain. They fled Spain, came to North Africa, went into Turkey, went into Italy, uh, and into the Middle East, where other Jews who had been living for centuries. Uh, and anyway, those are the original, those are the Sephardi Jews, the Spanish Jews. But today, in a general broad sense, uh, we, we speak of Sephardi Jews as being those Jews who's who originate from North Africa, the Middle East. It could be Italy. It could be other places as well, if your family originally is part of that, those ge geographical areas, as opposed to Ashkenazi Jews, which are um, either Western or Eastern European in their origin. I say origin, of course. Origin is, is, is Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel. But later historical origin, uh, the Jews got divided in into these two groups, and each of these two major population groups uh, developed some different customs from one from the other. And one very beautiful custom of Sephardi Jews, which today in Israel were all here mixed together, so many Ashkenazi Jews adopt Sephardi customs, many Sephardi Jews adopt Ashkenazi customs, but uh, when someone is um, either visiting someone who is uh, sitting Shiva, and when a person sits Shiva for seven days in their home, um, people come and visit to make condolences and to sit and to talk, and uh, you have food out, and Sephardi custom is to pick up that a piece of food and make the blessing, the appropriate breath blessing on that piece of food, and then say what we call an ilui nish, nishama. Um, we say it's for the uplifting of the soul of the deceased person, uh, which is just a nice, beautiful gesture. Uh, we all want to take part in, in giving a push, as it were, a spiritual push for the person's soul to, to quickly make its way to its rightful place in the next world. And so with different foods, we say different brachot. If it's uh, something that comes from a tree, we say Borei Priya Eitz, uh, creator of the fruit of the tree. So if you are having a, a cashew, 
you'll say Bharipriya eats. If you're having a peanut which comes from the ground, you'll say Bharipriya Adama, uh, creator of the fruit of the earth. Uh, if you have a piece of cake or a cracker, you say Bharimini Musnod, creator of many, um, I guess we'll say, uh, baked goods or grains, grains, and so on and so forth. If you happen to be having something that, for example, I have in my hand right now, a shot glass with some bourbon in it. And uh, since bourbon uh, is a processed, uh, it has a very complex process, and uh, when we look at it, we don't recognize that it's from a tree. It, it doesn't look like it's from a tree. It doesn't look like it's from, a, from the earth. Uh, so it's what we say, shehakol niya bidavaros, that everything which was created or came into being by his word, by Hashem's word. It's a very beautiful blessing, which we say over water, we see over many kinds of foods that don't fit into the other categories. So I'm going to say uh, this ilui neshama, for the uplifting of the soul. I'm going to mention then my mother-in-law's name, and then I'm going to make the blessing shehakol, and then I'm going to have a sip of bourbon. I want to be uh, coherent uh, for the show, but I just wanted to say this, uh, to do this, um, share this with you. Uh, so here goes. Le'ilui nishmat nomi bat Yosef Sfi ufegi. For the uplifting of the soul of Nomi, the name of my mother-in-law, the daughter of Yosef Sfi and Fegi. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam shehakol niya bidavaro. There, done. I've had my bourbon. I had a sip. I still have more in my glass, and I will be partaking of that throughout the show, because after all, we are on the eve of Purim. And Purim is known, of course, as a, a happy time, a festival of joy, and a festival of, um, of a, a very earthy festival. Simply, there, are, there are a few commandments, a few mitzvot, and these are mitzvot that come from the book of, of, of Esther, and it's interesting because these are things that Esther instructed the people to do in her day, which was about, well, the story of Esther takes place in Persia, today Iran, and it takes place in the period between the uh, destruction of the first temple and the building of the second temple, which is 5-something BCE. Again, I haven't really done my, my proper uh, preparation today, so... Um, I'm going to be fudging a few things, but I'm doing the best I can. Um, bourbon, bourbon uh, allowing me. Um, and um, she instructed a few things that the people... In, first of all, there's the fast of Esther, which is tomorrow morning, begins tomorrow with, with the sunrise and closes with the sunset. And, of course, we read in the, in the book of Esther, she actually... Uh, told Mordechai to tell to, to to gather up all the people of Shushan, all the Jews of Shushan, the capital of Persia, uh, and have them fast for her because she needed to go to Ahasuerus, the king, who she was married to, but he still was the king, and she needed to plead on behalf of her people because one of uh, Ahasuerus's most favored uh, uh, ministers was Haman, the evil Haman who wanted to destroy the Jews. And he wanted to destroy the Jews because one Jew named Mordechai, one Jew named Mordechai refused to bow down to him. Uh, he insisted that people, the subjects of the king, that when he walks through the streets, uh, Haman, that people bow down to him. And, and Mordechai uh, would only bow down to God. He would not bow down to Haman. So he became very angry and decided that he was going to uh, destroy all the Jews, kill all the Jews of Shushan, of, of, of Paras, of Persia, because of his anger at Mordechai. And of course, the uh, kingdom of Persia, the empire of Persia at the time, stretched from today India all the way up to Kush, which is Ethiopia. Um, so it basically um, uh, was the geographical home of of all the Jews in the world at that time. So his plan to destroy the Jews of Persia was nothing less than genocide. And 
uh, Mordechai caught wind of this. And Mordechai, of course, being the uncle of Esther. And Esther, of course, is the young, the young girl who became the bride of Ahasuerus after Ahasuerus' wife Vashti um, was insubordinate. And so he had her banished. I think he had her killed. And then he was looking for a new wife. And he was going through all the maidens of, of Persia uh, until uh, he uh, ran into uh, uh, Esther, also known as Hadass. And um, she found favor in his eyes and became the queen. And now she needs to ask him to um, give her permission, her people permission to fight against Haman. It's a very, very fascinating story, the story of, of, of Esther. Uh, lots of twists and turns. A lot of, and of course, it's known for nafohu. It's known for sudden changes of, of fate. You know, something bad's going to happen, and all of a sudden something good's going to happen. Something's good going to happen, and something's bad. And again, um, one of the most prominent features of the book of Esther, also known in Hebrew as Megillat Esther, which is literally the scroll of Esther, because when we read it on Purim, we always read it from a scroll. Uh, and uh, it's read, we, we need to hear it publicly, read out loud, and uh, we need to hear the whole thing, so we can't be making noise during the reading, except the custom is that when Haman's mention is, name is mentioned, we make a lot of noise. People bring all sorts of noisemakers and blow horns and bang their feet and all sorts of things in order to... Uh, um, in a way, metaphorically, uh, perform the commandment that we read about last week in Parshat Zohar to blot out the memory of Amalek from earth. Uh, and Haman was a descendant of Amalek. And Amalek, of course, was the first uh, nation that set upon Israel when Israel left Egypt. Even before Israel went to Mount Sinai, before she had received the Torah, uh, these Amalekites, these Amalekites, uh, for no reason just attacked Israel uh, brutally and viciously, and they have uh, earned the title of uh, the arch enemy of, of Israel ever since, and we are commanded to destroy Amalek. And every year we do so in a um, symbolic sense. Uh, when we read a Parshat, I'm sorry, when we read a Megillat Esther, and when we uh, make a lot of noise, every time Haman's ma name is mentioned, in the reading, okay, I'm going to have another sip of my bourbon. Um, so, as I start to say, we, we hear the, the Megillah of Esther, and only after hearing it in the evening do we actually break our fast. So even though the fast is from dawn to, to dark, as soon as the, it gets dark, we... we uh, we mit palel aravit. We say the uh, evening prayer, and then immediately after that, we listen to uh, Megillat Esther, and then only then do we actually go home and break our fast, and then the festivities begin. But the commandments are of uh, the mitzvot of of the holiday of Purim are to uh, hear the Megillah, to uh, bring uh, gifts to um, poor people and to bring mishloach uh, manot, to bring packages of, of food and beverage to, to friends uh, and loved ones um, and to have a mishte, to have, uh, I'm sorry, a suda, mishte is a suda, to have suda purim, which is a, a meal, a festive meal, and the other um, I don't think it quite gets the title of a mitzvah, but it is a minhag, and it's uh, really there's there's no no two ways about it is to get inebriated. You don't have to get inebriated. Many people do, but the real mitzvah, the real commandment behind all this is to get to the point where you can no longer differentiate in your mind between uh, Baruch Mordechai, which means blessed be Mordechai the hero, along with Esther of our story, and Aror Haman, cursed be Haman, who is the villain, of course, of the story of, of Esther. So why? You know, so much of, of uh, 
what uh, Torah is all about, what Judaism is all about, is the differentiating between good and evil, and you know, knowing to do right and to and to clear away from doing wrong, and uh, leading a proper life. And all of a sudden, on Purim, we're instructed to get to a point in our consciousness where we can't really differentiate between good and bad. First of all, it's very, very difficult. <laughs> I got to tell you that it's very difficult uh, to get to that point. Um, I suppose if you become so inebriated, they become uh, unconscious, you're at that point. But really, the idea, of, and uh, I don't recommend that, the idea of Purim is not to, you know, for for just uh, careless uh, and and uh, wanton uh, drinking or drunkenness. No, uh, we, we're supposed to drink, you know, to raise our joy with, it's a, it's written in Psalms that uh, wine um, uh, causes, uh, gives man pleasure, gives man joy. And so we always associate wine with, with joy, with happiness. So whether it's wine or, or other uh, alcoholic beverages, you know, it's all part of the festivity. The, really, the idea isn't to get yourself, you know, uh, sick, uh, God forbid, by drinking, although that happens sometimes to some people, uh, I've heard. Um, but uh, the idea is to reach a state where you don't differentiate between good and bad. Why? Why do we want to get there? Uh I mean, it's a question that there, there's all different kinds of attempted answers and there's all different kinds of answers and, and they're very beautiful answers and there's always more than one answer. Um, you know, we, at a certain level, at a, you know, in, in God's uh, plan, it's all good, right? There's, it's all good. Even when, you know, why do bad things happen? It's always a struggle. How do we understand a world where God is good? And bad things happen, but on a higher level, beyond our intellect, you know, we're locked into the world of, of, of good and bad, of good and evil, right? We're locked into that world because man ate from the from the fruit of the tree of knowledge, ate from the tree of knowledge uh, of good and evil. So we're kind of locked into that world, and and that's how we understand things, and that's through that world God communicates with us. But there's a world above that. There's literally a world above that, where a world beyond and above good and bad, a world where it's all good, or it's all God's will, which is good. And we try to lift ourselves up on Purim to an, uh, an appreciation of the fact that, you know, the world has lots of, lots of tragedy, lots of pain. You know, look at the world today. I don't think I need to specify uh, too much. You know, look around. There's a lot of bad things happening, a lot of horrible things, painful things. Uh, you know, we have pain on a personal level, and we look around. You look and you know, you read the news, and it's just there's a lot of bad. But on a higher level, it's it's all part of of, of God's will. It's all part of God's plan. So on Purim, we try to, um, we try to, you know, astral project our, our, our consciousness into a point where we're in that higher level, and that's true joy when we can appreciate that it's all good. That's true joy, and that's true happiness. Why Purim? Okay, we want to reach this consciousness, but why Purim? Why not? Uh, let's say. Uh, Yom Kippur, otherwise known in Hebrew as Yom Kippurim, which is Yom Kippurim, it means Day of Atonements. It's just the plural of the word Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, Day of Atonements. But uh, it's more familiarly known in 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 Hebrew uh, as Yom Kippurim. Why do I mention Yom Kippurim as 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 an example of another holiday where we might want to reach a level? I mean, we. Yom Kippurim, we're striving to become closer to God. We're striving to overcome our bad inclination. We're asking for, for forgiveness. We, we want to be better people. Maybe that's the day to try to reach this consciousness of, 
of it's all good. There's no, there's no bad. It's all good. It's all God's will. Why do I mention Yom Kippurim specifically as opposed to another holiday? Because you might have recognized that the word Yom Kippurim has the word Purim in it. And the Hebrew prefix, a one-letter prefix, the letter is Chaf, and we pronounce it Ki, it has the meaning like. So Yom Kippurim, if we parse it differently, instead of saying a day of atonement, we're saying a day like Purim. So we have all of a sudden, wow, we have a ready-made comparison uh, between between Purim and and um, and Yom Kippurim. So what do they have in common, and what don't they have in common? Well, interestingly, on Yom Kippurim, right before Yom Kippurim, which is a, a fast day, we have a big meal called the Suudah Mefseket, a, a, a meal that that is the last meal of eating, and it basically, you know, gives us the 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 nourishment and the energy we need to get through the next 25 hours without eating. And so we eat and then we fast. On Purim, we fast and then we feast and then we eat. Uh, of course, uh, Yom Kippur is a very solemn day, a very serious day, you know, and we we are going over our, you know, our, our own who we are and, and, and you know, trying to weed out the, the bad things and, and, and strengthen ourselves and, and work toward being better people. And on Purim, we just kind of let it go and, and, and uh, you know, kick back and have a great time. You know, almost, could almost to uh, someone, an outsider, not knowing what we're really trying to achieve, might look hedonistic, God forbid. Um, but really, on, on Yom Kippurim, we're talking, we're, we're focusing on, on, on good and evil, and we're trying to overcome whatever evil inclinations we have. We're trying to rid ourselves of, of, of the negative and, 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 you know, strengthen the positive. We're very focused on this, on this dichotomy that we live in of good and evil. Um, but on Purim, we try to overcome that. You know, on Yom Kippur, Yom Kippurim, we realize, we see very much so that our actions have effects. You know, they have ramifications, and we are responsible for all that we do. And and that, you know, we have this relationship with God, and everything's, everything's in the books. Everything's in the book of life. Everything we do, it's all in there. On Purim, the story of Esther, a fascinating thing about the book of Esther is that God's name is not mentioned in it once, not once. It's the only book of the 24 books of the Hebrew scriptures in which God's name is not mentioned even once. In fact, there was a debate uh, when they were canonizing the, the, the different texts that became the Tanakh, which is the, the Hebrew acronym for, for Torah, uh, Nevi'im and Ketuvim, which is the Torah, the five books of Moses, the prophets, Nevi'im and the Ketuvim, are, are the, from Psalms and onward. Uh, they're known as the written works. And so there was a debate whether Esther had a place in these holy scriptures because God's name is not even mentioned, not once. But yes, uh, the sages very much decided that it, it did belong. And... There's the concept uh, behind this. I'm going to have another sip of my bourbon. Of Hester Panim, which is mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy uh, toward the end when Moshe is telling the people that, uh, you know, that he's going to die and he knows that in the future they're going to backslide and uh, turn away from Hashem. And then Hashem, in response, is going to is going to hide his face from them. He'll be, he'll be hiding from them. We won't see God, right? And, and the fact of the matter is when we, when we ourselves turn from God, when we turn from the commandments, when we don't walk in God's way, when we you know, start doing things we shouldn't be doing, we don't see God anymore. We, God becomes hidden. We, our, our, our eyes are dimmed. God's, we don't see God in everything that we do. When we're, 
and when we're upright and doing the right thing and following God's way. God hides his face and bad things happen and we don't know why. And we look and we cry out, and God's not there. Now the word Esther, the name Esther, is, 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 is basically the same Hebrew root as the word Nistar, which means hidden, Hester Panim, with a hey, Hester Panim is, is the hidden face of God. Esther, with an Aleph, is the name Esther. So we learn that the book of Esther is a book that, that, that occupies itself with this whole concept of, of God. Where's God? We look around and, and do we see God? And, and very clearly in the book of Esther, God's name does not appear, not even once. However, that makes it our challenge and, and our responsibility to see where God's hiding in the book of Esther. And, and in fact, there are our sages have you know, shown us this place, that place, where if you look at it, you know, if you read it this way, you see that God's right there. But in general, in life, you know, you look around, where's God? Like, what's going on in the world? Where's God? Um, but we have to find God. Yes, uh, when God's hiding, it's really a reflection of ourselves hiding. You know, it's like a child. He covers his eyes and, and, and assumes that nobody can see him. You know, if we cover our eyes and don't want to see God, then God won't be seen. It really works. <laughs> God disappears when we, when we stop looking. Um, so the challenge of Purim and the beauty of Purim is seeing that God really is everywhere. And where is God present, more present than, than in any other situation, any other circumstance in life, and that is in happiness and joy. So it is a supreme commandment always in Judaism. This is very serious, very serious commandment to be happy, to be joyful, because God is with us in our joy. And we learn again in Deuteronomy, we're told, you know, there's a whole long list of, of all sorts of uh, bad things that are going to happen to us if we turn from God and we read it each year, and it's a horrible list, and it goes on and on and on, and then in the middle of the list, there's a little break, and it says, all this is happening to you because you did not do the commandments, the mitzvot, with happiness, with happiness in your heart, right? It's not that we didn't do them. It's that we weren't happy. We didn't find joy in doing them. They weren't bringing us joy, but that's what they're intended to do. That's what our relationship with Hashem is intended to, to make us happy, and if we're not finding happiness in that, then we got to work on it. You know, something's off. Uh, so uh, Purim is, you know, you're living in a world and you, uh, you're looking at where's God? Like, what's going on here? And in the, in the, in the reality of, of, of the Jews and the story of Esther, they were under threat, real serious threat. You know, today, those same descendants of, of Ahasuerus and Haman uh, and the Persians are is Iran, Iran. And they are threatening day and night. They th are threatening Israel with annihilation, the same plan that Haman had. And uh, that's why they are, want to achieve nuclear uh, weapons. And, uh, you know, in the West, I would say uh, Joe Biden is very much playing the role of a Hashbirosh because he wants to make a deal. He wants to satisfy the, the, the desire of, of, of Iran to be able to produce within a few years uh, nuclear weapons and do with it what they will. He wants to reward them, uh, lift sanctions and, and cause billions and billions of dollars to flood into Iran. He wants to lower the gas prices in America and, uh, you know, uh, Iran, Iranian oil will, will help with that, especially with the situation with Russia and the prices going up, et cetera, et cetera. He's like a Hashverosh, uh, uh, Joe Biden. Yeah, he doesn't care this way or that. Make him, make him unhappy. Let's make him happy. Uh, you know, maybe at some point Israel will, uh, just like uh, Esther, Israel will be able to appeal uh, to, to uh, uh, Biden to... Uh, Give us the green light to go after 
uh, Iran, just like uh, Esther and Mordechai were given the green light to go after after uh, Haman. But it's a crazy story, right? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. You put it in terms of Biden and Iran, uh, it's, 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 it's insane. And well, it's just as insane when we bring it back into the original context of Ahasuerus, Haman. And so again, who are today's Mordechai's and today's Esther's? I gotta tell you something. I know I'm rambling and um, I've got a few minutes left in my rambling and I'm getting close to the bottom of this. It's just only a shot glass. It's only a shot glass of bourbon. It's not that much, but um, fortunately it's got me thinking back on track, Purim style. Um, two, two, two unique aspects uh, of, of Esther and Mordechai in how they dealt with evil and how they were able to overturn an evil situation and, and make the, the good uh, win out in the end. Mordechai quite literally stood up to evil. He would not bow down to Haman. Um, and that strength that he had, you know, he's known as very interesting. He's known as, uh, when he's first introduced, we're given his name and his father's name and his grandfather and the tribe that he came from. And he's known as, as, as Ish Yehudi. He was the Jew, the archetypical Jew. He was a Jew par excellence. And, in, and what that means is that he would not bow down to, he would bow down to none but God, to none but Hashem. Uh, he would not bow down to Haman. And that means in today's terms, you don't buckle under because the President of the United States says something or because Putin says something. You don't buckle under. In fact, Israel had a prime minister many years ago named Menachem Begin who... Uh, one time, I forget what the situation was, it was a serious situation, and the president at the time, and it might have been, I don't remember, it might have been Carter, and Begin, his response to whatever America, I forget the details, what it wanted Israel to do was, I, you know, uh, I, we, a Jew bows down to no one. That was his motto. You know, we're going to do what we need to do to protect ourselves. Um, and this is Mordechai. He would not bow down. And of course, not bowing down to Haman, Haman raised the ire of Haman. And that's what got this whole thing going. Haman couldn't stand it. He's going to destroy an entire nation of people. In fact, he says, and again, if I were more prepared, I would have it in front of me, but he says in the Megillah, he says to, he, when he goes to Ahasuerus to ask permission to destroy the Jews, he says there's a nation within Persia, which is, which is Mufuzar, which is spread out, which is which is all over the place, um, but also means in Hebrew, which is he meant, he meant that they were a diaspora, that they were you know inhabiting all different parts of the kingdom, of the empire, but in Hebrew it also means they were divided, they weren't united, and so they were weak. When the Jews are not united, when we're either divided because we're spread out all over the globe as we were for 2,000 years, or we're not united because we're arguing, God forbid, with one another. We're, we're very weak, we're very vulnerable. And that was a situation. And so when Mordechai stood up to Haman by not bowing, he stood up to evil, that evil Haman wanted to destroy this divided nation. So what was Esther's strength? What was her brilliance when she needed to approach Hashverosh to get his green light to fight Haman and to destroy Haman and to destroy all he wanted to do. She told Mordechai to gather up the Jews together, to unite the Jews. And a united Jewish nation is a strong Jewish nation. And a strong Jewish nation united can overcome all evil. I'm running out of time here. I haven't even finished my bourbon. I wish everybody a wonderful, 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 happy, joyful, warm. Thank you so much. Temple Talk.